Welcome everybody to this masterclass. Thank you, Pan Macmillan, for making it happen. As we always say to our community, if you long to be a writer, of course you need to read. But it can be invaluable to hear a writer speak about how they go about creating the books which transport us into other lives and other worlds. So this is what we're privileged to experience today. So thank you, Tony, for joining us and giving us some insight into your process and into your writing. It's great to see so many of you here, a lot of whom we recognize. I'm sorry that we will keep you muted through this because there's so many of you that the background noise creates a kind of babble that makes chaos. If you want to add or ask something during the process, please type it in the chat function. I will be trying my best to keep an eye on it and include you. Some um, comments or questions I might hold until later if I feel they, they fit in or will, or will be answered by questions um, a little bit later in the discussion. And we did receive two questions beforehand, and I'm going to slot those in at the point, at the appropriate point during the discussion. Okay, so Tony, I'm going to ask questions, which I think will take us logically through the writing process, from the first idea to the finished product, because I think that will give everybody a good idea about um, how they begin and carry on through the process to the end. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is, tell us a little bit about how the germ of an idea first appears. Does it come to you in different ways with different books? Like the first inkling of a character or a story scrap or an image, or perhaps from research into a subject or a period that interests you? Yeah, thanks, Joanne, and thanks for having me, and welcome to, to everybody from where, wherever you are. It's great to be here, and especially great to be um, uh, surrounded, if I can use that term, by people who are specifically interested in writing. I guess, I guess a, a lot of you are. So that's why I'm, I'm also very interested in any questions that you may have. And so as Joanne says, please do, do feel free to shoot a few through on the on the comments. That's a really good question. And uh, I find myself now in the position where right now here in Australia, Lockwood, back in my other home in South Africa, but I'm editing my book for next year. Uh, and then at the back of my mind, I'm starting to think perhaps starting to have the first murmurs of what to write next. Um, because I, I don't know exactly what, I, what I'm going to go next. And, and as with a lot of things that we might talk about is I, I can't get too hung up about that because I have to believe that an idea will come from somewhere because that's part of the process. It's not about overthinking for me or over planning. What am I going to write next year in the next book and the one after? Um, I, I worked for a number of years as a journalist be, before I started uh, writing uh, full time or even before I started working on my first novel. Um, I, I'll, I'll preface this comment by saying I, I certainly don't think that's necessary for a writer to have worked in the media or a, as, a, as a professional writer. And, and I don't honestly think there's an awful lot that I took with me from journalism into novel writing. But there are a couple of things, and one of them is knowing a story. And, and by knowing, I mean you, you, you come across something, you, you read it, or you overhear it at a party, or, or it might be you might eavesdrop on a chat somewhere or um, in, in a workplace or around a campfire, and someone says something or you read something that may have already been reported, and you get what is almost a, a visceral feeling. For me, I probably had a couple of characters do this in my book. It's, it's almost like a little jolt in the fingertips. And, and, it, and, it, and it energizes you and you think that is the premise for my next book. And that's, that's all I need. So the, the, the current book, Last Survivor, I won't go on and on about it, but that, that was a, a, came from a discussion that I had with a friend of mine uh, 
who was living in Zimbabwe. She, she and her husband had been farming and they had lost their farm during that country's land redistribution program. And then amongst the chaos and turmoil of leaving their farm, they had to relocate to a house in Harare. They had to gather up all of their family belongings and possessions and they were kicked out of one house and had to move into a much smaller area. And, and you think, well, what do you take with you? you? You take your valuables and your passport and your family photos and things of monetary value and sentimental value. Well, this lady was showing me around her now very modest suburb, absolutely gend. They were, as I learned, psychads, which is what this book's about. And of course, as a journalist, you ask questions. You talk who, what, where, when, why, and how. And I, and I think one of the things that stayed me with the journalists is this, is this need to ask questions, sometimes at my own peril. But the first question I had to ask my friend rather bluntly is why? Why did you bring all of these plants with you? And she said, because they're worth a fortune. And all of a sudden, I got the feeling in the fingertips that I had experienced in the past when I was looking for story ideas. So I think it's an, it's an instinctive thing. But beyond being an instinctive thing, I think coming up with an idea for a story, it, it pays to use that other skill that, that journalists are taught. This is something to take on board, is the journalists are taught to trained observers. So the ability to observe and listen helps you in so many ways as a writer, whether that's research, or developing an ear for a story. Um, so I think turning on those powers of above observation, those senses, that's where you come from. That's how I, in, in, I wouldn't say I go looking for new ideas, but there, there are plenty of places they come from. And to answer the mechanics of your story, yeah, I've taken stories from uh, newspaper articles I've read, uh, conversations around a braai over a drink. Um, I get a lot of ideas for books over a drink. Most of them disappear the next day, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> Yeah, great. Um, yes, I, um, I think that uh, that's absolutely as I recognize it to all those places that stories can come from. Then that germ of an idea, that tingling in your fingertips, it needs to be developed, it needs to be drawn out into a story. Um, so we always like to say that story emerges from who your characters are and what they want. I noticed this quite strongly in your, your stories, that your characters want something and this drives each story. So do you, is this a kind of starting point for you after the germ appears? Do you turn to the characters before developing the story further, decide what kind of characters you need for example to care about psychads or you know whatever that that particular germ is i i knew your questions were going to be good <laughs> and this is a very good one it's making me think as you're asking the question i'm thinking how am i going to answer this because i think a lot of for me, there is a little bit like the whole process in that I don't, I don't plot. I'll say right at the beginning, I, I, I don't plot anything. I have in the first book I wrote, I plotted meticulously and I prepared character profiles on all of my characters and I did all this stuff that I'd been told in a couple of books to do about how to write. And, and, and to cut a very long story short, that book never saw the light of day. It was never published because it didn't work for me. It wasn't an enjoyable process and the book never saw the light of day, quite justifiably, I would say, because I don't think it was a very good book at all. But so the way I work now is I, I, I just need a premise. I just need that idea to start. And I think the next thing that happens is that a person is dropped into that premise. And, and that person, I'm just trying to think about this now to relate it to a few of the books I've done. Uh, if, if I have a premise, I just need to drop a person into that premise. And, and sometimes that person, that first, I'm not going to say based on someone I know, because I don't base characters on someone I know, but it could be that character has an experience that's in common 
with the person uh, that that has perhaps given me the idea for the story. Uh, I, I wrote a book called The Hunter, which is about a particularly uh, Southern African crime of, of faking one's own death to claim on insurance. It's quite, quite common. And in Zimbabwe, it had become an art form and a minor and very a minor yet profitable industry in that country with a number of players from police, doctors, um, uh, undertakers, uh, parish priests in some stages, all having their share of this little pie where they assisted people to fake their debts. That story came to me over a beer with a private investigator, a friend of a friend of mine, uh, an elderly gentleman, a fantastic guy. Now, that gave me an idea. I could write a story about people faking their deaths. And wouldn't it be good to have a private investigator investing it? My private investigator may not be a 70-year-old white man living in Harare. He might be a 45-year-old um, half Angolan, half American hunky safari guide who moonlights as the private investigator. So the, the, character, the character is almost begins as a thought bubble, as a, as a premise. And then I think to answer your question, then what happens is that character has to interact with another character who then has to interact with another character. And, and, and so I go about developing the characters almost as if you were meeting them around the same campfire. You don't know them. I don't know them. And you know what, uh, Joanne, I, I don't care that I don't know them. I don't care that I know their backstory at this stage, nor even what color hair or what color eyes, or you know, their ethnic back. I don't care. Just let then reveal myself to them. And that's the fun for me. The fun for me is not just making up the story as I go along, but it's letting the people reveal themselves to me as I go along. So I guess if I can try and translate it into something hopefully useful to people that are interested in writing, if I dare be so presumptuous, is that you, you may want to know everything about your characters before you put them into your story. But if you don't, don't worry. And, and, and don't spend time trying to flesh out characters when they could, given half a chance, do that for you. Now, the other thing that happens with, with me, and, and I'm editing at the moment, so I'm thinking about this, is I, I by the time I've finished the first draft, I know a lot about my characters. I know much more about them. And so then if I want to flesh them out or, or make them truer, I, I can't really do that until I've finished the first draft. I can then uh -huh. go back and do my first rewrite because now I know who you are. Now I know you're actually the bad. Yeah. But I didn't thought you were quite a nice person. <laughs> you might still I, be a nice person. So I, I think that's the fun, yeah. you know, and I, and I can't equate it to, to, to how we are going to meet you via Zoom. You're a nice person. I'm sure we have a bit in common, but I don't really know you. Yes. I was actually, uh, Tony, there are a couple of comments saying, please, can you sit a little closer to the mic? And you are breaking up sure. a little bit. But I think that we will um, we'll see how it goes with that. Um, if it gets too bad, say, because Tony says he can move to somewhere else. But at the moment, I think we're still okay. Um, yes, Tony, I was about to say, if you allow your characters to emerge during the writing process, it does often mean that in the rewrite, you have to go and flesh them out a bit more at the beginning again because you they've sort of developed and revealed themselves to you as you've been doing the first draft. But then the beginning, of course, doesn't contain all the complexity that perhaps they do at the end of the book. So, but I I think you've you said that that you in the rewrite you go and yeah and it's you pick up inconsistencies too because i don't yeah. take the time to flesh out the characters first and i think it also again it, we may cover this but it translates to the way the way you write I, I never review as i go along deliberately and so i i, I have terrible inconsistencies i have characters whose names change the color <laughs> of their hair changes yeah. their eyes change. i can't remember people's names 
but I don't let that stop me. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's no shortcuts in this business. I think is the one thing that I, I do say to people is if you are someone who, who can prepare your characters in advance and plot your novel in advance, that will take you a fair bit of time and work. And if you're someone like me that just makes it all up as they go along and wizards through the first draft in a few months, you spend a lot more time going back, fleshing out, fixing it. There's no, there's no shortcut. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yes, I absolutely uh, attest to that. Yeah. It's, I I think if you are a, a, a planner, it can make it easier, but there are pros and cons because then if you've planned everything and you get a brilliant idea in the middle, um, you um, tend, it, it makes it more difficult for you to, to perhaps incorporate that idea. Um, but on the other hand, as you say, it means more work in the rewrite mm. afterwards. Definitely. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so um, just something else about characters. We always um, advise students to avoid having someone else sweep in and save the day for a main character. And why that str struck me was reading your books. I noticed that your characters, particularly your women characters, are always proactive and they play an active part in saving themselves and what they care about. So I, I wondered if you gave that thought and whether you can expand a bit on why that's important in a story. Yeah, I, look, I, I think it, it's a, it, there's so much, I've been thinking about this too. There's so much in writing that's about balance, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, whether it's description or characterization, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Stephen King's book on writing, you know, the, the oh, book yeah. on writing a memoir of the craft, which I happen to have, happen to have here. Um, and I, I reread that book every year before I start a new novel. And, and he says, you know, when it comes to description, a, a, a few well-chosen details will stand for the rest. So it's getting that balance right. So I, I think when you have a, a hero or a heroine, more often than not, uh, I think in this case, is the balance is, is you, 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 you don't want them to be a superman or a superwoman who yeah. saves the world perhaps all by themselves. Yeah. But ne neither do you, do you want to take away from their, their sense of achievement or the obvious obstacles that they they have to overcome. Um, I, I, I liked uh, reading, I still like reading books uh, that have a strong female lead in them. I don't know why, I've, even I'm a guy and I've been in the army and stuff like that. And I, I've never really been drawn to the boys own action books. And one of the things I think I struggle with, perhaps not so much in South Africa, but in other markets is, is that I think booksellers and even some overseas publishers I've had have tended to pigeonhole the books as kind of boy Bravo two zero action military books because they look at my background and they think that's what they are and they're not you know I, and I don't want them to be and the majority of my readers are women which I'm so I'm very pleased about but I think beyond that I I, th I, I like to you know I, I think I like to make things a little bit different. Um, uh, if I'm going to have a, a, a mercenary hero, you know, well, why not make it a heroine? Why not make it a, a, a woman? You know, it's, it's not just to be different, but because I think it would be more interesting, you know? And, and so that's where I got the idea for a recurring character that I have Sonia Kurtz. But again, I, she, it's funny, you know, balance is a funny thing because if, if she, was if she did half the things that she did, if she did half the things that she did in an ordinary book and she was a man, people would say that, you know, she's, she's a psychopath, <laughs> a nutcase, but it kind of works in your favor because she's a single mum who has a terrible choice in men and a terrible relationship history. People, I think, tend to see her as this kind of kick-ass role model, affirmative, you know, strong female character. So, yeah. so it's good. See, I, I, but that's, that's, that's me making a joke. She, she is a reflection of many of the women that I served with in the, in the military. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, extremely capable, 
extremely resourceful. So uh, I, I, I think that um, I'm trying, trying to get to get back to the back to the question. Um, I I think probably what it comes down to is you should only write about stuff that you 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 really want to write about. You you should they say write what you know. Yes and no to a certain extent. You know, um, it's good to have a basis in 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 something that you're you're writing about. But write the sort of book that you would want to read yourself. And I happen to like books uh, that are thrillers with a bit of mystery and a strong female character who's put in a situation of distress, but then definitely not a damsel yeah, in, yeah. in distress. Mm. So, yeah, I think probably if I, if I put any thought to it at all, which I don't, but this is why these questions are so good. It makes me think about what I'm doing and, and critique what I'm doing. Uh, I think it comes back to one of the basics and, and, and one of the basics is write about what you want what you like and what you would like to read. One of the classic mistakes I made with that first book that never got published was I, I wrote a book set in the Australian outback because I thought that was what foreign publishers and foreign readers would want to read from an Australian. I had never been to the outback and I wasn't particularly interested in anything I was writing about. <laughs> I made the classic mistake. It would be like me saying, I'm going to write a vampire book because Stephanie Meyer sells lots of books. You know, it would be silly for me to do yeah, that. So, yeah. so I get, yeah, I, basically I'm cheating. I'm just writing the sort of book I would like to read. Well, I totally agree with you because in actual fact, I, I recently wrote a blog saying much the same, that when, don't try and please some imagined audience, write the kind of book that you would like to write. And yes, um, absolutely. I wasn't meaning that um, your characters should not have a vulnerability and complexity because I, as you do, I think that's very important. Um, and, and I think that is so with a character, we will put up with a character doing quite awful things sometimes if they do them for the right reasons and we can feel their, their vulnerability and their um, you know, the inability to find any other way out. Yeah, yeah way. I mean, I yeah. think, and, so. and again, you, you learn as, as thing goes on. And, and, and look, I'm a big, I'm a fan of the professional editing process because I have very good editors that I've worked with. I've, I've been lucky. I've had the same editor, not over all of my books, but a couple of fantastic women I've worked with who have been my editors and the same publisher all the way through. And then before they even look at it, my wife and my, uh, my mother and my mother-in-law all go through the books. Only women read this book until it gets published, trust me. <laughs> so if anyone's got an opinion on a female character in one of my books, I've heard it already. Yeah. I'll tell you. But, but I, I think on a, on, on a more serious note, if, if someone takes the time to tell you something constructive you should you should be a little because i have had characters in the past funnily enough men usually and um they've been too flawed and and i remember my mother-in-law famously telling me of a of a of a male ex-special forces turned anti-poaching character who i thought was quite a tough guy in my book my mother-in-law on the after reading the first draft says this guy is a wimp and a loser <laughs> <laughs> For goodness sake, just harden him up a little bit. <laughs> so, you can be too flawed. Yeah. You don't want someone to whoop in and save the day. And you don't want a completely unrealistic Rambo or Rambo et character. But let's not drag the reader down yeah. too much with people, faults and flaws. As no, well. absolutely. Okay, which carries us quite nicely on um, to um, a question that I was going to ask about research or a couple of questions about research because research clearly is quite an important part of your process so um, I thought of a couple of your books for example Ghosts of the Past takes place in the past and the present in different locations Last Survivor contains huge detail about all sorts of things terrorism the CIA weapons psychads so I've wondered if you could just, as an example, take us 
through the process of researching one of these, just pick one, and where you looked, how you go about doing your research? Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, I will say that I have learned a lot by making mistakes, by, by making ev every mistake in, in the book. Um, so to, to look at a couple of them, I'll give you a, a bad example and, and a good example. My third book was a book called African Sky, uh, which was set in, uh, it was actually set in Rhodesia rather than Zimbabwe. It was set during the Second World War. And it was set on, a, on an allied pilot training base in Rhodesia because a lot of Australians and Brits and Canadians went there to learn to fly in the wide open African skies. Now, I was in, I'm interested in military history and I'm interested in aeroplanes okay. and I love Africa. This book had me written all over it right from the yeah. start. So I researched that thing to death and I loved every minute of it. I dragged my wife to aeroplane museums literally almost around the world, you know, I read up on it. I, I interviewed people who, who had been in bomber command during the second world war and a woman who lived in Bulawayo during that period. And I immersed myself totally in the research. And of course, as you could probably guess, um, probably about 90% of the material that I had lovingly crafted and put into that book got cut by my editors and publishers yes. <laughs> because I fell into that classic trap that people fall into is they get too wrapped up in the research and the detail. And again, as Stephen King would say, a few well-chosen facts will stand for the rest, yes. Tony, not 50 pages about how to fly Harvard, AT6 Harvard aeroplane, you know. But the other big danger uh, with, with research, and it was a danger in that book because it, it slowed me down. It was almost, it's a great, it's a, it, it's a great way to procrastinate. Research will, will keep you away from writing. Mm. And that was my third book. And I was putting myself under a bit of pressure and I almost wanted to ditch it at the end because as much as I loved writing it, it was taking me too long to write. And when so much of it was cut by the publishers, I thought, oh, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. Well, all I'd done is wasted too much time researching. So over the years, I, I have worked out what works for me because I've also come to learn that if you are someone who writes by the seat of their pants and who doesn't plot and plan, then just write. For goodness sake, just write. Don't find any excuses and research is an excuse. Don't find any excuse to stop or slow you down because you're going to have plenty of time down the track to go and fix things up. So what I do when I write a book now, and Last Survivor is a good example about it, I have my premise I had a, a, a lengthy discussion with my friend who told me a bit about psychats. Um, she told me that about 15 years ago, the US government, she thought it was the FBI, it was actually the US Fish and uh, Wildlife Service, as I discovered, mounted an international undercover two-year operation with a fish and wildlife inspector from the US posing as an illegal psychad trader and he ran this multinational, multinational two-year operation through Africa, through South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Australia, and the US, and infiltrated this psychad smuggling gang and brought them. I thought, well, if I, that's a story. This is my book. It's just about writing itself. Um, and, and I learned that psychads were very valuable, worth millions of dollars. And at the time, I, I was having a beer with a, a, another guy from Zimbabwe, who had been training anti-poaching rangers in Mali, of all places, where the where poaching, uh, uh, killing of elephants for their ivory and various other criminal activities are predominantly used to finance extremist terrorism. That's what I have described to you there in, in that amount of time is the extent of my research for that book. That's it. I had three ideas, that much information, and then I went away and wrote a book. Now, and, and I did what I have learned to do. I research retrospectively. So I write the story. If I don't know something, I don't know the name of a particularly valuable psychad or what it looks like. Uh, if I don't know the workings of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, if I don't know what it takes to be an undercover operator, if I don't know exactly what's going on in Mali or where the poaching is happening, it doesn't matter. Because throughout that first draft, the word check is littered throughout that manuscript in bold 
in brackets. And that's how I write my story. If I don't know something, I just leave it out or make it up. When I get to the end and I go through my first draft, I read through my first draft and do my first edit. Now, a lot of those annotations, those checks, they're gone. It turns out I didn't actually need anything. I didn't need that passage or that piece of information. But what I'm progressively doing is whittling down the amount of research that I have to do. And then, I, I, this is the other thing that I've I found really helped, is, is that when I need to go and learn about cycads, I don't need to know everything there is to know about cycads because it's impossible for me as a lay person to learn that. But I have now specific questions. So I can then use the internet not to look for information, but to look for people. So I look for experts. So I track down, I use the internet to stalk people, I'm afraid. And I go and find experts and I send them an email saying, my name's Tony Park. I write books set in Africa. Can you help me with a few questions I have about psychics? And you know, Joanne, I would say 99.9 times out of a hundred people say yes. I know. And then I have, I have a specific mm -hmm. list of questions to ask. And I say, I don't want to waste your time. I've got four things I need to know. And then if I'm lucky, they'll later agree to read the manuscript or part of the manuscript. And that's, that's, that's the, to me, that's the best way to research. Retrospectively, yeah. I'm sorry if that bursts a few people's bubbles, because believe me, I know how much fun research is. And it is so much fun. But look, if you're researching, you're not writing, you know, and, and, and so you can't, you know, and people say to me, I've spent all this time researching this story, but now I'm finding it really hard to write. I said, well, you know, you've, with respect, you know, you should have spent that time writing, you know, and the research can come later. So, mm -hmm. so, so I've just found trial and error. That's what's what I did wrong. And then what helped me afterwards. That's really interesting because I think you have answered my, what was going to be my my next question, which is how do you make sure your research doesn't end up being too forefront? But when you research retrospectively, that does away with that with that issue, with that problem. On the other hand, I I don't know about you, but I find when I write that um, research, or perhaps it's not research, but knowing something can, it works on another level because I've always found that if I set out to write about a small town, say that I know vaguely, um, I, my actual writing is stilted unless I know the direction to the town hall or where the movie theater is or and my actual writing then suffers until i walk those streets or look at them and and know you know how the town works out and a lot of that detail you might not even use but it sort of frees up my writing somehow so yeah I, that's yeah. A, that's a good point i mean i i, I also have to kind of think how I would normally write. I've just finished a book now for next year, uh, but that's all been written here in my spare bedroom in Sydney. It's been quite difficult. It's been quite difficult yeah. to write. Um, and I have largely set that particular book in a very confined geographical area. It's basically set probably within about a 10 kilometer but a book like ghosts of the past that you mentioned goes all throughout namibia um it goes uh to australia where i was for for some of it because i think i, I probably should say that the other thing i do when it comes to location is is that apart from this book i've just done now is i tend to write i tend to set my book wherever i happen to be so last survivor goes from uh, starts in the UK. I was with the UK. My wife, I was in the UK. My wife was there for a business trip. So it starts in Kew gardens in the botanical gardens in the UK. Yes. Cause while she was doing her important business meetings, I went to Kew gardens to have a look at some plants. Um, and then the book goes to, to uh, various parts of South Africa because that's where we were traveling. So I, what I should say about my research is sure. If you can gain inspiration from your surroundings and work in a little bit of detail, I, I do find that helps me, 
because um, so it, it, in in a book like Ghosts of the Past, it goes all through Namibia. I was traveling through Namibia when I wrote that book. And so I was kind of by osmosis, I guess, if that's the right word, drawing research and inspiration as I was writing. Because I count research different to sort of, uh, research to me is more technical rather than location, because generally I'm writing about the location I happen to be in. Um, I, I wrote a book called The Cull a few years ago, uh, which is set in South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Malawi, and Tanzania, because my wife and I and a couple of friends, friends went on an 11,000 kilometer road trip all the way to Tanzania and back from South Africa. So every, pretty well, every campsite we stayed in is in that book. Yeah. So I think I'll, I'll kind of revise what I said before, is I, I research retrospectively, but if you can gain a bit of mojo and a bit of inspiration by looking at your window and working something into your book, do that, you know, because I'm doing that all the time. I, I think that's something that works for me to because I am, you know, I didn't first go to South Africa until I was like 31 or 32 years old. I don't have residual knowledges of places that you get as a kid. I, I could write about where I grew up in, in Australia from memory. But if I'm writing about the Zimbabwe, what for me like this um, is, is to travel the locations and, and work the place into the writing as I'm, as I'm writing. So I, I'm not so much researching places later, just I'm more researching technical facts yeah, and things like that. Facts. So I'm kind of, yeah, yeah you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's, it probably is, a, it's not as simple as I made it out to be before, but I do subscribe to the fact that keeping your nose in a book or scrolling the internet for hours and hours and hours, all in the name of research before when you should be writing is bad. Thing. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, Okay, um, I see a question has come in, but I think we have more or less covered it. Busi Sekile um, says, how do you incorporate your research into your writing so it isn't too obvious that you read up on this and that it grows organically with the story? Um, that is a good so, question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know what I think that is? I think that's, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of it now that I'm editing because I'm, I'm writing a book now about a subject that is more cultural than technical. And I've been talking to uh, some friends of mine uh, from the community on the border of the Kruger Park near where we live by Skype and by Facebook and stuff to help me with research. Now, what you don't want to do with research is download, even if it is good stuff that's been given to you by somebody else is you just put in a slab of information. Oh. And I think this is where a questioner is coming from. Yeah. Totally valid. Now I think this links to that other wonderful thing that we, I'm sure we've all heard of. And if we haven't, we should have, which is show don't tell. So I think the way you reveal your research is super, super important. It's better to have someone talking about, for me, Zimbabwean politics uh, in a conversation in a book over a beer, rather than me giving the reader a little bit of an aside about the history of Zimbabwe's liberation, you know, and, and or showing the effects of some historical injustice through the eyes of a character. So I think, yeah, on that question, I would say the answer to that question, hopefully, is, is, is how you, if you have some pertinent research and you, you are 100% sure you need this in your story, the next question is, how do I, as the author, feed that or give that to my readers? And I think that's show, don't tell. That's where show, don't tell comes in. I think you have somebody or something that you paint a picture of or, 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 or describe a conversation that... That, uh, that again, that helps. Uh, you asked me about characters, something. There is something I came across the other day about characters. And this is something I've just brought in mind. I got this from Ken Follett. I was, I was watching a video interview with Ken Follett the other day. And he says the, the most important things for him when he's starting a new book or looking at characters is uh, um, what's this all about? What, what do these characters hope for in their life? What are they scared of? And why should we care about them? 
And I think when it comes to characters and perhaps when it comes to research, that's, they're good questions to be asking you about. Why, why do I care about this information? Is it really important? Uh, or am I just demonstrating my newfound knowledge of a, of a subject? And, and, and another thing that I remember hearing a few years ago, I'm, honestly, I can't remember who from, is if you're writing uh, a thriller like I am, not everyone's writing a thriller, right? But pace is important. And, and pace is possibly one of the most important things. And, and I have had editors tell me this. This information is interesting, but if it's not pushing the story forward, if it's not making us care about the character, if it's not amplifying or showing the character's hopes or fears, what's it there for? Mm. You know, that's, uh, yeah, and I think they're probably good guidelines. So that's actually a very good question. Yes. Yes, actually, that's something that we often say, everything has a job to do. Every character, every detail, everything that you include must have a job to do. Um, as you Way say, taking the story forward or illuminating your characters. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's an important way of looking at it. Um, and a related, a smaller question here from Andrew. When you're using a town, do you use the real name or a similar sounding name? And the same goes for major companies. Mm. Um, mm. Good question. Good question. So I don't know what the textbook answer is, but I'll tell you my answer on this. A, a large part of my readership, as it happens, I'm not saying I write for a particular group of people, but I get good feedback, hopefully. Um, a large part of my audience is expatriate South Africa and Zimbabweans living in Australia or the UK or the US. I have learned my readers want to be put in the wimpy in hazy view. <laughs> they yeah. they yeah. love that. They have fond memories of the wimpy yeah. in hazy view. They have fond memories of the Shell Ultra City at Middleburg. <laughs> okay. And they yeah. like and they have fond memories of Table Mountain and various other places. So I use, and the spur, I use real locations, real restaurants to kind of add a little bit of realism to the thing. Now, I, I will answer that question by saying, not if there's going to be a murder there, okay? Not if something bad, or, or not if the food was terrible. <laughs> you know? um, I, I actually, I don't, I don't, have the time or the inclination to contact everyone whose business or hotel or, or, or property I might mention. But uh, for example, in a book called The Empty Coast, I had a shootout at a, at a very nice B&B uh, that, that was, was actually uh, an old colonial, German colonial fort from the days of the German uh, colonization. Of the, it was a beautiful atmospheric place, but I was set to have a major gun battle there. So I actually emailed the owners of that, that hotel, that b and and I said, this is me, here's the deal. And they said, we'd rather if you don't use our name. So I gave it a fictitious name, a fictitious location, because it was a bit nasty what was going to, to happen there. Uh, I, I, by the same token, I have had people who have discovered their, their, their restaurant or their shop or something mentioned in one of my books by chance, and, and they love it. You know, I, I think it's, but I think it comes back to that. I hate to repeat it again, but that Stephen Kingism that a few well chosen details will stand for the rest. But Dion Mayer does it wonderfully. He'll, he'll put his favorite restaurant in Cape Town in there. Um, and I want to go there because if it's Dion Mayer's favorite restaurant, I know it will be good. And I, <laughs> I want to go there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, and companies. Yeah, look, I think companies, you've got to be careful, not if you're saying they're polluting or destroying the environment or they're evil or whatever. Uh, I, I think you can sail a little, little bit close to the wind. Uh, you can be too clever. So, um, uh, you know, as a journalist, we were always taught that truth is the, is the only defence against libel, you know. Um, so you don't want to be getting sued or whatever. But I've certainly never had uh, the owner of the the spur at Messina contact me and say, how dare you put my restaurant in, yeah. in your book? <laughs> you know? So yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a balance. And 
and I like it because I, I have friends in the safari business. Uh, I'm an investor in a lodge in Zimbabwe in a place called Natwich, and you'll see Natwich featured in my latest book because why not? You know. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I do give it some critical thought, but I think my my test is as long as I'm not being nasty, I think it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another um, one from uh, um, uh, our um, audience. Um, how far can you stretch the truth in fiction? Um, that, I found that quite an interesting question because, um, because, yeah, I think there's quite a balance there too, but let's turn over to you. It's a tricky one, isn't it? You know, mm. uh, and again, I think possibly relates to that last answer I gave is you, got to, you don't want to get yourself in trouble. Um, you know, I find a funny thing happens uh, and it could just be the nature of this wonderful, incredible, sometimes upside down continent that we live in. I'm talking about my other home in Africa is that I will be writing something in a thriller and I'll think, this is crazy. I have pushed the boundaries too far. And you know what, then it happens in real life. <laughs> so I, I, had, I was writing a book called Ivory, which is about modern day piracy. And it opens with this movie type scene that I had in my mind of this giant car transporter full of luxury four by fours being hijacked and then run aground on a beach and, and all of the luxury cars are driven off through the sand dunes. And I thought, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And then as I was writing it, I tuned into the BBC World Service and I heard that some Somali pirates had just hijacked a ship carrying tanks, battle tanks for the Kenyan army. And they had stolen all of their tanks on the way to Kenya. So, but I think the serious answer is you don't want to, you, again, you don't get yourself into trouble. Uh, but I wrote another book called African Dawn, which is set in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia and Zimbabwe from 1959 through to what's their present time. And it's a story of three families, and it's a bit of a saga about rhino protein and conflict within that country through its transition to independence. You, you can't, uh, I don't know if my internet's going there, you can't write a book uh, set in Tony. from 19, 1960s through the 2000s in Mugabe. So you have to put some fact in there and you don't want to play around with it too much because it affects people's lives. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure that answers the question. I think it's mm. a balancing act. You know, you, you don't want to mess yeah. around too much with the truth. You want to be realistic, even if you're fiction. Yeah. And be careful mm. if you're dealing with real people, even if they're mm. deceased. Also with them, um, I mean, I often say I once stopped reading a book because um, it started with somebody arriving at the Johannesburg airport and driving into town and the approach to town was wrong. And it annoyed me so much that I couldn't continue. Um, so that level of truth, I think, is hard to mess with. But on the other hand, as you say, yeah, it's yeah. a balance. That's a, that's a good point um, because I was reviewing another person's novel, which I don't do, but he was a friend of a friend of mine. And he had the flight from Johannesburg uh, arriving at Sydney early in the morning. And I said, it doesn't happen. And he says, yeah. oh, no, it's fiction. It's fiction. I, can, I can make that, change that to suit me. And I said to him exactly what you just said then, Joanne. I said, people are going to stop reading this yeah. because you think – You've got one easy thing like that wrong. What else yeah. have you got in, in, in this book? And that's, that's a mistake I've made in the past because getting back to research, I, I said earlier, you know, there, there's all these wonderful adages that we get taught. Some of them are very good. Show don't tell is a good one. Write what you know is a good one. Read a lot, write a lot is a good one. But when you say write what you know, 
you have to also be wary of that other great adage that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So I was in the army and I know a little bit about firearms and weapons, but I guessed something and I was wrong. And I got probably got more criticism over getting the specifications of that bullet wrong than I have in anything else yeah. in the 18 novels that I've written. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to be. <laughs> I know. Okay. I thought we would perhaps um, leap a little into action scenes. We always like to say to our students that because uh, sometimes they rush at an action fee scene and tell us very quickly what happens because they feel it's got to be quick and pack punch. And we often say it seems counterintuitive, but instead of rushing dramatic action scenes, um, they should pay attention to the detail, try and carry us through every second of that so that they can share, reader can share in the experience of it as it happens. And I noticed that this is something that you very much do in your action scenes. You, you carry us through, you know, the detail of the scene so that we experience it second by second. So I thought I'd ask how you approach pacey scenes and go about writing them. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because I'm, you know, again, you, you kind of think, oh, I just make it up as I go along, but there is more to it than that. And, and thinking about it again, I, I, I just what, what you've just asked me then reminds me of this Ken Follett interview that I, I just watched the other day. And, and Ken Follett admits he is someone who plans and plots his novels to the yes. nth degree. He does, you know, he, yeah. He's a very methodical planner. And he, he talks specifically about a climactic fight scene in one of his books. It may have been Pillars of the Earth. But he said he wanted that one action scene to go for six pages, which is a long fight. That's a long fight scene. Yeah. And he yeah. almost treated that action scene like a whole mini plot in itself. Now, I think that, because you're asking me very probing questions here, I probably put more thought into those what could be fairly quick, you know, action packed vignettes than I do the whole book. Because yeah. number one is, I, you know, I, I think everything has been done in the past, you know, and, and so what I find myself doing is, is I try, I do put a, quite a bit of thought into finishing people off and into, into fight scenes because I'm, I'm wary that it's, it's, hopefully it hasn't been done before. And if it has, I want to do it differently. So I think you're right. I think it's probably good, even if you're someone who, who madly types away by the seat of their pants, like I hope I do if I'm, if I'm in the groove. But I think it's worth just taking a breath and slowing down because in the thrill scenes, I mean, they're up there with the boy kisses girl scenes and they deserve as much rigor and as much thought as well too. Because I think if you just go in or bang, 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 guns blazing or whatever. Um, I think people will also gloss over a bit. You know, I think you need to build the tension and the ups and downs and the trials and tribulations and the he hero or heroine overcoming the adversity just as much you want to do in the whole book. Mm. So I think probably what Ken Follett was getting to is that your pivotal action scene your scenes, like your romance scenes, have to be ha, have as much theme and structure as perhaps the whole the whole story does. I've never thought about this, but you're exactly right. Thank you, Jane. I'm learning a lot from you. It's going to help me with my, with, with my with my editing. Okay. It is definitely going to help me because I think also it's it's about pace, but not too pacey. It's yeah. about detail, but not too much detail. It's all easy yeah. to say this. Kind of. I had, I'll tell you an interesting one. Um, I had a scene in my uh, second book, Zambezi, in which the pin is pulled on a hand grenade. And in between the time that pin is pulled to when the hand grenade goes off, quite a lot of stuff happens. 
and I had a very good editor. This is my second book. And my, my editor said to me, hang on, there's a lot of stuff happens. Yes. She said, how, how long does it take for a grenade to go off? I've been in the army. I know that it takes five to seven seconds for a grenade to go off from the time you pull the pin. She says, can you do all that in five to seven seconds? Now, I still had a day job at the time. I'm lucky this is my job now. But I was working in a PR company and there were two young interns, these young women I was working with, who, because they were interns, they wanted to, to help and do everything and whatever. I said, you pretend that you're lying on the ground there. You pretend you're holding a gun there. I'm going to pull the pin on this hand grenade and we've got six seconds to replay all this action that goes on. So it took quite a bit of thought power. We did make it just, but, but, but I, I then stepped back and thought, yeah, you can't rush this stuff. You yeah. know, you've got to, you've got to build the tension and, 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 and what is it? Ken Pollard said, make, make, make the reader care about these people, even within each individual scene, there's a lot to do, but it's fun and, and it should be fun. Yes, yes. The, um, um, as you, that, that's another area where if you get it wrong, you lose that willing suspension of disbelief, as you said. Um, and I think often um, what we're talking about here is caring about the detail. Not, as you say, not too much detail, but the right details, because I think people tend to gloss over these scenes when they're written in generalities or told rather than shown. Mm -hmm. And if you use the show the right detail, as you say, then, yeah, you carry the reader with you. Yeah, and have it express um, people's dialogue or actions or things rather than just saying yes. he punched them in the mouth. You know, exactly, exactly, yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, we've only really got time for one more question. So I think I'll jump to the end and say, how do you make sure that an ending resonates in the mind of your reader and that they carry that away with them? I, I probably spend more time on the ending, disproportionately more time on the ending when I'm writing. And then when I go back and do my first edit and read through more often than not, I'm rewriting the beginning because to me, they're the two most important, important things. Now on occasion, perhaps on more than one occasion, my publisher, Kate, same publisher in 20 years has said to me, Tony, did you just get to 120,000 words and think I should end this book? <laughs> which, which I say, Maybe. Maybe. So you've got to, yeah. you've got, I, but I say, I like a cliffhanger ending. She said, no, you're just being lazy. So I think, yeah, uh, the, the, the ending to me required, how do you do it? I don't know. To me, what, you know what I do? A little tip. Can I give a tip? You know, tips are worth yeah. perhaps nothing. Exactly. But, the, but what I have found I've been doing lately in the last few books is I work to a fairly tight deadline. I do a book a year and sometimes I do a nonfiction book as well. And, and I, I, I write my book, I make it up as I go along. I go through some ups and downs, peaks and troughs. I get to the middle. I think there's not going to be enough and I panic. I get near the end and then I write furiously. And then I get near the end. And I think, how am I going to end this thing? So then what I've done, and I've done it exactly with the one that I'm working on here right now, I have written 118,000 words and there's no ending to this book. So then what I do is, although I am a seat of the pantser writer, not a plotter, I go back and I do my first edit and I get right up to the point where I have just about finished. And then once I've done that first edit, I give it to my wife and she starts going through it. She's my first reader. And while she's reading it, I start to work on the end. And then I spend quite a bit of time there. Now, the other reason I do that, and I'll try and do this quickly, she's one of the people who picks up a book and reads the first two pages and says, I know how this book's going to end. And then, um, you know, what she reads the end, you know, like <laughs> I said, why do you do that? She says, because I know how it's going to end. And I just wanted to prove I was right. So when she's reading the book, the first edit, this is my tip. She's going, oh, I know it's going to happen here. And this is, this person's the baddie. And I'm thinking, no, they're not. <laughs> or if they were, I'm going to make it someone different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tip. 
Yeah. You can be, you can have a bit of an each way bet. You can be a person who, who makes it up as they go along, who invents their characters out of nowhere. But maybe when you get near the end, maybe stop and go back and do all that other work and then save the ending until last and give it the, give it the, the thought and the time that it deserves. Because honestly, it's like what we were saying at the start. I don't know who these characters are when I first start writing the book. And, and then I'm still not, may not know all about them until I've gone through it once again already. So maybe I don't know how it's going to end until a little bit later on. So that's my, my, my half answer tip. <laughs> that's great advice, Tony. I have just realized that I didn't work in the two questions that were sent in to us. So if, if everybody's happy and if you don't mind carrying happy, over yeah, two I'm minutes, happy, yeah. I think I'll, I must ask the two questions that were sent in to us. And um, that's for Frankie and Carol. Okay, so Frankie asked um, a, a simple question, although I think it's not a very simple question. <laughs> How do you push through when a character or plot flounders and seems to be going nowhere? Do you scrap him, her, it, or find a way to rescue the situation and plod on? Uh, generally, Frankie, if I get stuck, I either kill a character off or make them have sex. So <laughs> that's my way of getting us all back in the groove or getting rid of them while carrying on. Uh, I, I would push on. Push on is my short and simple answer to that. So <laughs> Okay, great. And then Carol asked, when you review the books you've written, are you s completely satisfied that you've written a story the way you intended? Or do you have little niggles about what you should have changed? And then she asks, she says she always wants to ask authors, do you feel you've accurately captured the picture you see, which the reader sees when they read your words? Yeah, the, that's such a deep question and a good question if you're talking about once the book's published i never i never have a look at them i, I don't you know, i wouldn't say i don't care about them but i'm too busy working on the next one people will email me and they'll say oh i, I like this but i didn't like this or what you should have done this and my response mentally if not via email is it's too late yeah you know i i can't, I can't be bothered about that because it's too late if you didn't like it you didn't like it now have i captured it the way the reader wants to see it I think this is going to sound a bit glib and, and, and I hope that it is, it is sincere and it does drive me. You know who I write for? I'm afraid I write for myself. If, yeah. if, I, if I find myself going through a first draft and I'm falling asleep, we're in trouble. Like we are in so much <laughs> yeah. deep trouble. We're going to kill someone or make them have sex because this book's going yeah. nowhere. If, if I get to the, the end of the book, generally after my editors have been through it and I look at that and I think I'm happy with that. And, and the sign of a good editor is if they've changed something and I think I should have thought of that. And that's how I respond to 99.9% .9 of the edits that I get over 18 years. I think, yeah, that's good. I should have thought about that. And yeah. I'm happy with that. Now what the reader makes of it, I, I don't want to sound big headed, but it, 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 I wouldn't say, and I certainly don't want to say it doesn't matter because every reader will um, will have their own interpretation. So I think if I have entertained myself during the writing phase, I'm, I'm happy. And if I've learned a bit from my editors, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm really pleased to say that if the feedback that I get from all of my novels over the years, there's, there's no one that stands out that people overwhelmingly like more than the others. I think that's great because People just have their own interpretations of a story. If everyone had said to me, your second, your third book was the best book you've ever written, I think, well, I've probably gone downhill. <laughs> so I, I, I dare to leave one piece of advice. Just, just enjoy it and write to entertain yourself. Write the sort of book you want to read enjoy doing it if you're not enjoying doing it if you're finding it really hard work maybe do it differently if you're a plotter maybe try really writing by the seat of your pants if you're someone that's been writing by the seat of your pants and you're finding you don't know where to go and you don't know what to do try a bit of plotting you know because it's got to be fun you know and and if it is something that 
that you enjoy and you love doing and and it's all you've ever wanted to do in life, you're at least hopefully going to enjoy doing it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. That was absolutely wonderful. And you gave lots of advice, lots of tips, lots of insight into your process. And I think that will help everybody. And I can see a lot of thanks flowing up on the chat group. So thank you all for joining us um, and, and for, for sharing the this time with us. Thanks, Joanne. It's been really good for me too. I'm going to get back to my editing with renewed vigor. <laughs> now. And thanks for all the good, incisive questions. Great questions, all of them. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.